This videotape is intended for use as an aid to the manuals provided for the assembly of your replicar kit. The videotape is not a substitute for the manual. Assembly and disassembly will vary from kit to kit. Should you encounter difficulties, consult the manual. If the manual does not give a satisfactory explanation for your problem, contact the company for assistance. By this videotape, GGL Industries or its associates does not make any warranties of merchantability, fitness for a particular purpose, or otherwise. Moreover, GGL Industries or its associates does not guarantee that the disassembly or assembly of your replicar kit will be the same as that depicted on this videotape. This videotape is provided as a demonstration aid to the instruction manual that comes with your kit, and in no way should the videotape be used as a replacement for the instruction manual provided. During the course of this videotape, we will either be disassembling a Chevette or Pinto donor car, or assembling the components removed from one of these onto a new frame. The completed new chassis will be the foundation for either a stunning recreation, styled after the legendary 1929 Mercedes-Benz SSK, or a spectacular reproduction based upon the king of the road, the 1952 MG TD. Before we begin, let's go over a few details. At the beginning of each replicar's instruction manual, there appears a list of tools and supplies necessary for the construction of each kit. All of these items will not be utilized during the procedures covered by this videotape. We suggest that both the donor car disassembly and new chassis assembly videotapes be reviewed, along with the corresponding sections of the instruction manual, before the project is started. Pinto and Chevette specifications vary from year to year. Because of this, it is impossible to show every mechanical configuration. Factory service manuals, identical to those used by dealer service departments, are available from Helm Incorporated. These are extremely technical. Less detailed shop manuals, such as the ones shown, are available from most local auto supply stores. One of these is an essential tool and should be obtained before starting the project. Most manuals that come with the replicar assembly kits have several pages covering safety precautions. It is extremely important that time be taken to review these pages. Some earlier manuals may not have the list of do's and don'ts found on these pages. Should this be the case, a call should be placed to our technical department. They will be more than happy to furnish a copy. Okay, let's get to work. In assembling the Ford SSK chassis, the first component we'll be installing is the rear axle assembly. Before doing this, we must reverse the rear spring shackle brackets found at the rear of each leaf spring. Using the appropriate socket and extension, the nuts are removed and the shackle and the shackle bracket is pulled off of the spring. We thoroughly inspect the bushings for wear, and if necessary, we order new bushings from Ford to replace worn ones. Since Ford recommends that all attaching rear hardware be replaced, we have purchased new nuts for the shackle studs. The shackles are simply flipped over from their original position, reinstalled, and the nuts are tightened, partially. Later, we will tighten these bolts to the factory torque specifications found in our factory service manual. After the shackle brackets have been reversed, we elevate the rear axle assembly by placing a floor jack under the differential located at the center of the rear axle housing. We roll the assembly under the steel tubular frame that has been supported on four jack stands. We slowly lift the assembly into position, making certain that the emergency brake cables run under the axle assembly inside of each spring. When the front spring eyes are lined up with the holes located through the mounting brackets on the chassis, we insert the two long through bolts through the bracket and spring mount on each side. Since Ford recommends that attaching hardware be replaced, we have purchased two new nuts and bolts from our local Ford dealer. The nuts are screwed onto the bolts and partially tightened. 
While it is possible to use only two jack stands, we have found that the small extra expense for the additional stands and the convenience they afford are well worth the investment. We continue to elevate the rear axle assembly so the rear spring shackle brackets go over the mounts on the rear cross member of the chassis. Slowly, we lower the assembly into position and we install 3 8 by 1 and a half inch long bolts with flat washers, lock washers, and nuts. We use grade 5 bolts that can be distinguished by the three lines on the surface of the bolt head. The size of a bolt is always determined by the diameter of its shank. Additionally, we have found that bolts slightly longer than recommended are perfectly acceptable. Our floor jack is lowered and removed from the axle assembly. Using an open end wrench on one side and the appropriate socket and ratchet, we tighten the front spring mounting bolts. Later, we will use a torque wrench to tighten these bolts to Ford's specifications. The two bolts that secure the spring shackle brackets to each side of the chassis are firmly tightened using the appropriate wrenches. We have decided to use brand new shock absorbers for our new car. They are fairly inexpensive and can be obtained from any auto parts store. Using the new hardware that is furnished with the shock absorbers, we first install the shocks to the mounting locations on the bottom of the lower spring brackets on each side of the car. After we have tightened the nuts on the lower studs with the appropriate wrench, we raise the rear end assembly slightly with our floor jack to allow the top studs to pass through the holes in the mounting brackets attached to the steel tubular frame. The new shocks we are using are direct replacements for the original Pinto. These are secured in the same manner as the bottom. This completes the rear axle assembly. In order to have the correct ride height in our 1929 Mercedes Replicar, it is necessary to remove one full coil from the bottom of each front spring. First, we mark the spring, and then we cut the coil with a hacksaw equipped with a special carbide blade. This is available from our local hardware store. Since the springs are hardened steel, this does require patience. In most cases, we take the springs to a local welder or machine shop and have them do the work. After we've cut the springs, we file or grind a one and a half inch taper at the cut end. This will fit into the recess on the lower control arm. After the front springs have been modified, we raise the lower front control arms into position at the bottom of the cross member on each side of the car. Using the original factory hardware that was removed from our Pinto, we pass the bolt through the front of the cross member lower control arm and out the rear of the cross member. We place the original factory nut on the end of each bolt. The procedure is repeated on each side of the chassis. The correct socket along with a ratchet is used to tighten the nuts on the control arm bolts. These bolts will be torqued to the specifications listed in our factory service manual.
We have disconnected the upper control arms from the wheel spindles so they could be properly inspected and painted. At this point, we shall deviate slightly from the factory manual. It will be a lot easier for us to install the front springs after the engine has been installed. That is because the weight of the engine will add necessary compressing force to the chassis. The original bolts are taped into place and the upper control arm is placed into position. We partially tighten the factory nuts. We have used a good quality red primer to paint the various components for visibility in filming. Normally, we paint the pieces with a high quality black gloss enamel before we assemble them. The nuts and hardware are painted yellow only for visual reference. The gas tank is installed next. We'll move to the rear of the car. The original Pinto straps in their correct position under the recesses in the gas tank will mark the correct location on each side of the cross member. This is directly above the rear axle housing. We'll use a center punch and mark the whole locations. Then, utilizing an electric drill with a 3 of an inch bit, we drill a hole through the cross member on each side of the chassis and through the straps. We place the straps against the bottom of the cross member and secure them in place with 3 8 of an inch diameter by 2 and a half inch long bolts with flat washers on both sides, a lock washer and a nut. Or we can utilize a lock nut if we choose, eliminating the lock washer. Again, we can use a slightly longer bolt with no problem. After we have secured the front of the gas tank straps loosely, we raise the gas tank into position against the frame rails. Note, the filler hole is on the left side. We pull the straps rearward, then up and over the rear cross member. Utilizing a pair of vice grip pliers, we pull the straps as tight as possible. When necessary, we use a C-clamp to secure the straps temporarily to the chassis. A center punch is used to create an initial indentation for ease in drilling. Our electric drill with a 3 8 of an inch bit is used to drill a hole through these straps and cross member on each side. 3 8 of an inch diameter by 2 and a half inch long bolts are pushed through the holes we just drilled. A flat washer is used on each side and the bolt is secured with a lock washer and nut. If necessary, we could eliminate the lock washer and use a lock nut as a substitute. Again, we could also use a 3 inch long bolt with no problem. We use the appropriate socket and ratchet to tighten all tank bolts and nuts at this point. The excess strap material will be cut off flush with the rear of the cross member. When fabricating the firewall, we refer to the instruction manual for proper hole size and location. While a number of different materials can be used, a piece of sheet steel is preferable because of its fireproof properties. We use a tape measure and china marker to mark all hole locations, referring to the instruction manual. Alternatively, a firewall is available from the factory that has all of the holes pre-punched, including those necessary for air conditioning and heater hoses. If we choose to use the factory firewall, we could block off any undesired openings. A center punch is utilized to establish all hole locations. Then, referring to the factory manual, we use the correct size drill bits and hole saws to make the necessary openings. The firewall is also bent to the specifications listed in the instruction manual in order to ensure a tight fit against the floorboard that will be installed later. After we have completed fabricating the firewall, we place it into position against the supports on the engine side of the frame. To ensure an airtight fit, we use window weld, which is a 3M product available at auto supply stores, or a good quality silicone sealer between the firewall and frame supports. We secure the firewall to the frame following the instructions in the manual. For our brake and fuel lines, we'll be using steel tubing that we have purchased from our local auto supply store. Available in various lengths, the tubing can be easily bent by hand. A coat hanger is used as a guide before the tubing is bent. We make certain the fittings are at the ends before we make our bends. Our drill, along with a 3 8 of an inch drill bit, is used to drill two holes through the driver's side firewall support brace for the brake differential valve or proportioning valve.
we angle the valve rearward, which makes it a lot easier to fit our brake lines to it. The original factory nuts are used to attach the valve and they are tightened securely. We always make certain that the valve is thoroughly cleaned with brake fluid before installation. The illustrations in the instruction manual are followed as we route our brake and fuel lines along the chassis. We use several lengths of steel brake tubing that we have purchased along with the appropriate couplers. Two 3 16 of an inch by 60 inches long, one 3 16 of an inch by 40 inches long, and one 3 16 of an inch by 20 inches long. For the fuel feed lines, two 5 16 of an inch by 60 inch long steel fuel tubes are used, and the fuel return line requires two quarter inch by 60 inch pieces. We route the lines and temporarily secure them to the chassis with large tie wraps. Later, after all connections have been made, we will use steel clamps to secure the lines to the chassis. After we thoroughly inspected the master cylinder that we removed from our Ford Pinto, we decided that its condition was questionable, and we purchased a remanufactured unit from our local auto store. Whenever we have any doubt as to the condition of any of the brake system components, we replace them without hesitation. The safety is well worth the small expense. The master cylinder is then positioned against its mounting brace, located on the upper left corner of the firewall. The holes are pre-punched, so it fits right into position. 3 8 of an inch diameter by one and a half inch long bolts with flat washers, lock washers, and nuts are then inserted through the holes on each side. We do not fully tighten the bolts until a pedal assembly has been installed. The two lines that go to the brake differential valve are the same ones we removed from our Pinto, and after thoroughly inspecting and cleaning them, we connect them securely. We have to bend these lines slightly as the position of the master cylinder in relationship to the differential valve is different than it was on our Pinto. Since we have decided to use old style custom gauges in our new 1929 Mercedes SSK replicar, it is necessary to install a new water temperature and oil pressure sending unit in the engine. These sending units are furnished with the gauge set and are installed very easily. After we remove the original Ford sending units, we install the new oil pressure sending unit in the upper hole located in the cylinder head on the left or driver's side of the engine. We tighten these securely, being careful not to strip the threads. Normally we use a piece of Teflon tape or liquid Teflon sealer available at auto supply or hardware stores when making any threaded connections of this type. Our new gauges will now connect quickly and easily and operate properly. The motor mount adapter brackets that we removed from our Ford have been cleaned and painted. We simply position these in place against the mounting plates on each side of the frame. The holes in the adapter brackets are aligned with the pre-punched holes in the mounting plates and we insert the bolts and nuts we removed from our Pinto. The appropriate tools are used to thoroughly tighten the bolts. We had the rack and pinion steering gear assembly thoroughly inspected and all worn parts were replaced. Then we painted the entire assembly. Now we'll place the rack against the front of the Ford Crossmember. We'll use the original Pinto bolts and nuts to secure the assembly to the chassis, passing them through the crossmember, then the rack and pinion. Normally, we insert the bolts from the rear and install the nuts on the front against the rack. In order to film this assembly, we are doing it in the opposite manner. However, we will simply flip the bolts around so that they go through the crossmember from the rear. Depending on the year and type of the Ford rack, we either find two or three bolts. The crossmember will accommodate both configurations. We use the appropriate socket and ratchet and tighten the nuts firmly. Later, we will use a torque wrench and tighten the nuts to the original factory specifications found in our factory service manual. After we have completed installation of the rack and pinion, we move to the driver's side of the passenger compartment and install the Pinto brake pedal. Because of the different types of brake pedals used by Ford, we find a number of different holes in the pedal mounting bracket. In addition, it may be necessary to modify the pedal slightly for comfort. We wait until after the seats have been installed before any modifications are made. 
After we have chosen the appropriate hole location, we slide the original bolt through the bracket and pedal from the passenger side. This will enable us to remove the bolt when the body is placed on the chassis. We then secure the assembly with the original nut. At the same time, we place the master cylinder rod along with the brake light switch on the stud located on the brake pedal arm and secure it with the original retaining clip. Now, we can tighten the master cylinder fully and check the pedal making sure that it moves freely. Our Ford steering column has been cleaned and painted and we're almost ready to install it. First, however, it is necessary to cut three inches from the tip. We measure and mark the column and use a hacksaw to make the cut while the steering column is secured in a vise or we have someone hold it for us. The column is placed in position under the mounting bracket that is part of the steel tubular frame. The holes in the Ford mounting supports are aligned with the holes in the frame mounting bracket and four three-eighths of an inch diameter by one and a quarter inch long bolts with flat washers, lock washers, and nuts are inserted through the holes. Once again, we could use a longer bolt here if we wanted to. The appropriate tools are then used to tighten the column and the ignition lock faces the passenger side of the chassis. We have now completed installation of the steering column. In order for us to connect the steering column to the rack and pinion assembly, we need to fabricate an extension as the original Ford column is too short we refer to the instruction manual and follow the details precisely. We use a 30 inch length of solid 3 quarter inch steel shaft and cut it according to the instruction manual. Then we have a notch machined in the piece so it fits into the factory Ford steering universal joint and we secure it with the original hardware. A top quality universal joint with 3 quarter inch bore diameter connects the two shafts together. We drill through the holes located in the universal joint through the shaft and secure with a grade eight bolt and nut. Then we will have the piece welded for added insurance. A top quality three quarter inch self aligning pillow block bearing is also obtained and will be utilized. Alternatively, a complete extension is available from the factory. When the extension is completed, we give it a thorough coat of paint. The nylon bushing will be used to seal the hole in the firewall. The extension is now ready for installation. Before we can fit our new extension to our chassis, we must bolt the Ford Universal to the rack and pinion. We have thoroughly inspected the rubber coupling disc. If it were worn or loose, we would replace the entire unit as the coupling disc is riveted to the flange of the Universal. We slide the flange at the lower end of the Universal onto the splined shaft of the rack and pinion and secure with the original Pinto hardware. Later, we will use a torque wrench and tighten to original factory specifications. Our steering extension can now be positioned in place. We slide the upper end of the extension through the hole in the firewall and into the steering column shaft. We have placed the pillow block bearing on the lower end of the shaft and we insert the machined tip correctly into the end of the universal using the factory bolt and nut to pin it in place. Next, we slide the pillow block bearing into position against the frame mounting support plate that is part of the chassis. The nylon bushing seals the passenger compartment from the engine compartment and is held in place with two metal plates that are bolted together through the firewall. After all pieces have been correctly positioned, we use our electric drill with a 3 8 inch bit and drill two holes through the mounting bracket using the holes in the pillow block bearing as a guide. 
3 8 inch diameter by 1 1⁄2 inch long bolts with flat washers on both sides, lock washers and nuts are used to secure the pillow block to the chassis. We use the appropriate tools to tighten the assembly. We drill a hole through the steering column shaft and the upper end of the extension inside the passenger compartment and secure the column to the extension with a grade 8 bolt and nut. Later, before we drive our finished car any distance, we will have this piece welded for added safety. Strut brackets come with the assembly kit. We simply place the brackets into position against the inside of the frame rails on each side of the chassis. Four 5 16th of an inch diameter by 3 inch long bolts are passed through the holes in the frame and strut brackets and secured with flat washers, lock washers, and nuts. We pass the bolts through from the outside for appearance, and we are using lock nuts in place of lock washers. The appropriate tools are used to tighten the brackets. Next, we will secure the Ford metal bracket that holds the rubber brake line. It goes to the rear brakes on the left side of the chassis. Placing the bracket in position against the chassis, we mark two hole locations and drill two 7 32nd inch holes through the inside of the frame rail. We secure the bracket with quarter inch hex washer head self-tapping screws. The rear brake hose was thoroughly inspected. Had we found any signs of wear or deterioration, we would have replaced it with a new hose obtained from our local Ford or Lincoln Mercury dealer. The rubber brake line is then connected to the bracket and retained with the original Ford clip. Then we attach the threaded fitting at the end of our new rear brake line that we installed earlier to the rubber brake hose and securely tighten the two lines together. After we have secured the rear brake line, we move over to the gas tank. We have purchased two foot lengths of 5 16 inch and quarter inch inside diameter rubber fuel hose from our local auto supply store, along with four stainless steel clamps of the correct size. We cut the hose to the correct length, slide the clamps over the hose, then slip the hose ends onto the fittings on the tank and the ends of the metal fuel and return lines. The fittings on the metal fuel lines were removed by cutting the flares off the ends. The fuel line clamps as well as the fuel return hose clamps will now be tightened securely. Moving to the front of our chassis, we are now ready to install the engine and transmission. Here we have a type of engine lift that can be rented from most local rent-all stores, along with a hydraulic floor jack. We've securely fastened a chain to the front and rear of the engine, making sure that the chain is of sufficient strength to support the weight. Many engines will have engine lifting hooks. These are really L-shaped brackets with holes through them. A chain is passed through the holes, or a hook is attached. Either way, the important thing is to have a chain that is of sufficient diameter and strength to support the engine and that the chain is securely fastened. Slowly, we lower the engine while we push it to the rear, guiding the transmission through the cutout in the firewall. This is not a difficult job, and while having someone to assist us would be helpful, it really is not necessary. A little patience is all that's required. Although this is the most convenient type of engine hoist to use, there are other types which work just as well. We can use whatever is available, as long as it's sturdy and intended for the job at hand. We want to engage the motor mounts attached to each side of the engine to the Ford through bolts that will pass through the holes in the engine adapter brackets that we bolted to the chassis earlier. We use our floor jack to elevate the transmission at the rear. Prior to purchasing our donor car, we had the engine completely inspected and any questionable parts have been replaced. A remanufactured alternator has been bolted to the engine and all of the electrical components have been checked. The engine has been completely cleaned, then repainted with the original factory colors that we purchased from our local auto supply store in convenient spray cans. We are quite confident that the engine will run as well as it did when it was new. The carburetor has been covered to prevent dirt from entering. When the engine has been positioned properly, the through bolts are inserted and the nuts are attached.
We then elevate the transmission with our floor jack and attach the transmission cross member to the brackets welded to the chassis. We use the original Ford through bolts and nuts and tighten the cross member securely to the frame. We then lower the transmission so that the studs on the rubber mount pass through the center of the cross member. The original factory nuts are installed and tightened with the appropriate tools. We then fully tighten the front motor mounts, nuts and bolts. Our engine and transmission have now been installed. Once the engine has been installed, the necessary weight has been placed on the chassis that will make it easier for us to install the front springs. The rubber spring insulators have been installed in the cross member and have been taped in place. We put the springs on the lower control arms, making certain that the end of the spring that we tapered earlier is not more than a half inch from the front of the depression on the lower control arm. Our floor jack is placed under the lower control arm and slowly elevated. The front rotors, wheel bearings, calipers, brake pads and rubber hoses have been thoroughly inspected and cleaned. Any questionable parts have been replaced and of course we have given the whole assembly a fresh coat of paint. We continue to compress the front spring carefully so that the stud of the ball joint on the upper control arm passes through the mounting hole of the wheel spindle. The castle nut is then threaded onto the stud, then tightened and torqued to original specifications, and new cotter pins are installed. Having installed the front springs, we can now attach the front struts to their brackets and to the lower control arm. The rubber bushings have been inspected and if necessary, new bushings can be purchased from our local Ford parts department. The threaded ends of the struts at the rear are inserted through the holes in the strut brackets that were previously bolted to the chassis. The original nut and large metal washer, along with the inside rubber bushing, are placed on the strut from the back side of the strut bracket and the nut is tightened. The two studs on the front of each strut are pushed through the mounting holes in the lower control arms and the nuts are threaded on. We tighten the bolts and we will use a torque wrench and tighten all front end bolts to original specifications. Our front suspension is almost complete. We have decided to replace the front shock absorbers with new units that we have purchased from our local auto supply store. Using the new top mounting hardware and bushings furnished with our new shocks, we insert the shock absorber up through the lower control arm, guiding it through the center of the springs. The original Ford bolt passes through the control arm and lower shock mounting bushing. It is then secured with the original nut. We then place our floor jack under the lower control arm and compress the spring assembly just enough to allow us to pass the upper mounting stud through the mounting hole. It is located in the center of the spring mounting recess of the cross member. The rubber bushing and washer are placed on the stud and the new nut is threaded on. The nuts are then tightened to their correct specifications. We repeat the same procedure on the passenger side. 
At this time, we secure the original Ford front brake hose mounting brackets to each side of the chassis, following the directions in the instruction manual. Of course, we have inspected the rubber brake hoses, and when necessary, replace them with new hoses. We connect the fittings on the metal brake lines to the fittings on the rubber brake hoses and tighten them securely. The original Ford drive shaft is too long to fit into our new chassis. Shortening the unit is left up to a professional. Checking our yellow pages, we locate a shop that can handle the job. Before we send the unit out, we need to determine the correct measurements. We insert the drive shaft yoke onto the transmission shaft, pushing it forward, allowing approximately one or two inches of play before the yoke bottoms out against the transmission shaft. Using a tape measure, we find the distance between the front universal at the center of the universal bearing back to the center of the bearing mount recess on the rear differential flange. Taking the drive shaft to the shop we've located, we give them this measurement. We have also had our drive shaft balanced and the universal joints were checked thoroughly. With our drive shaft in hand, all that's necessary for installation is to slip the splined yoke onto the transmission shaft, then push forward on the drive shaft and slide the rear universal cups into the recessed area on the companion flange of the differential. Once this has been done, we insert the original Ford U-bolts and tighten the nuts with the appropriate open end or box wrench. Installation of our drive shaft has now been completed. Moving back to the front of our chassis, we locate the left and right radiator brackets that are furnished with the Replicar's assembly kit. We place the brackets into position, lining up the holes in the brackets with the pre-tapped holes in the chassis. These are located on the frame rails just inside the front crossmember spring mounts. We use three quarter inch diameter by one inch long fine threaded bolts, normally referred to as a 20 thread, to attach the brackets to the chassis. When necessary, we slightly enlarge the bracket holes with our electric drill with a rotary rasp that we can find in any hardware store. Carefully, we tighten the bolts, making sure that we don't over-tighten them and strip the threads of the bolt or the threads tapped in the chassis. A trick we use here is to put a few drops of oil on the threads before assembly. Now that we've installed the radiator brackets, we can mount our radiator to the brackets. We use our electric drill and a quarter inch drill bit and drill two holes in the rear flange on each side of the radiator. We are careful and make sure that the radiator does not come into contact with the frame. Since we have decided to use an air conditioning system in our car, we had the upper hose neck moved to the opposite side. We checked our yellow pages and found a radiator shop that performed the work. At the same time, they thoroughly cleaned and painted the unit. At times, we find Ford radiators that may require some other slight modifications. An existing radiator may have been replaced in our donor car. We place the radiator from the front into position against the brackets and secure with quarter inch diameter by three quarter inch or one inch long bolts with flat washers, lock washers, and nuts and tighten the unit into place. We measure the distance between the upper and lower radiator to engine hose connections, allowing enough room to clear any obstructions. Generally, we use universal flexible hoses of the appropriate length found at our auto supply store, along with stainless steel hose clamps. The hoses are secured to the engine and radiator. Next, we reconnect the two automatic transmission lines to the transmission and then to the fittings located at the bottom of the radiator. Engine coolant will be used to fill the system before we run the engine. Next, we move to the passenger side of the engine compartment where we find the exhaust manifold. Earlier, when we disassembled our donor car, we determined that the only reusable piece was the exhaust header pipe that bolts to the manifold. At this point, we check with the state motor vehicle department to find out any necessary emission requirements. After our car is finished, we will take it to a local muffler shop and have the exhaust system completed. If the complete exhaust system were usable, we would refer to the instruction manual. 
and make the necessary modifications and install it. Or we might build the rest of the system ourselves, obtaining the necessary parts from our local auto supply store. It's very important to make sure that the exhaust system is supported by the appropriate hangers and that the system does not come into contact with any part of the chassis. If our car came with a catalytic converter, we would reuse it if the state motor vehicle department required its retention. The appropriate wrench is used to tighten the nuts that secure the exhaust header pipe to the exhaust manifold. The accelerator bracket that bolts to the engine just behind the carburetor requires modification in order to clear the brake master cylinder. We place the bracket in a vise and following the instruction manual, we use a hacksaw to cut a V-shaped notch in the bracket. A pair of pliers is used to remove the piece. Then we bend the piece upward and together to close the notch. At times, this can get a little tricky, so we test the piece by placing it on the engine. Once we're sure that the fit is correct, we drill two holes and attach a small strap to hold the unit together, or alternatively, the piece can be welded. After the bracket has been modified, we bolt it to the engine using the original bolts. Then we attach the accelerator cable to the bracket. At times, we find a problem with the accelerator cable length this is because of the different types of carburetors Ford used. We can order a 1980 cable that is listed under Ford part number EOFZ-9A758A. Also, if we decide to use the original air cleaner instead of an aftermarket unit, we will need to obtain a fiberglass carburetor offset mount available from the replicar manufacturer. This slightly relocates the air cleaner and allows proper hood clearance. After assembly, we test the unit to make sure it operates smoothly and doesn't bind. Following the details in the instruction manual, we fabricate a battery box for our replicar chassis. Alternately, a fiberglass unit in a high gloss black gel coat finish is available from the factory that allows clearance for mounting a heater as well as an air conditioning unit. We use Window Weld, which is a 3M product, available at most auto supply stores or automotive paint stores, and apply it to all frame areas that come into contact with the battery box. The reason we do this is to seal the engine compartment. We could use rubber weather stripping or good quality silicone sealer if we wanted. The battery box is centered, allowing it to overhang the chassis an equal amount on each side. If necessary, we may need to trim the sides slightly when we install the body. Following the instruction manual, we use our electric drill and drill holes through the front and rear mounting surfaces of the battery box and through the top of the frame surfaces. We use hex washer head self-tapping screws and secure the unit to the chassis. Later, when we mount the body, long bolts will secure the body to the frame going through the battery box.
Here we have two floor liners for comparison, as we must do some preliminary work prior to installation. We have almost finished our chassis at this point. We'll start with the emergency brake lever holes and the opening for the brake rod mechanism. Following the illustrations and text in the instruction manual, we first mark all dimpled hole locations, as well as the scribe lines for the shift lever cutout with a china marker. We also mark a hole just to the center left of the transmission tunnel for the speedometer cable. As indicated in the instruction manual, a close fit is needed where the firewall meets the floor liner, so we next mark the front of the floor liner in order for it to be properly trimmed. The front corners and the flanges on the sides are marked and then will be trimmed. We always refer to the manual when any questions arise. Now we will use a drill with a 5 16 inch bit to open the holes we have marked we always use safety glasses. We will also, as shown here in the manual, cut out the opening for the transmission shifter. With a hole saw, we cut out the speedometer cable hole. We have used a saber saw with the appropriate blade to cut away all the marked areas. Now, we will install the transmission selector with four 5 16 inch bolts approximately one inch long and secure it using flat washers, lock washers, and nuts. Whenever we bolt through fiberglass, we use a flat washer under any bolt head or nut that comes into contact with the fiberglass. This spreads the tension of the bolt over a larger surface. Next. We slip the emergency brake handle into position with the rod and rubber boot extending through the hole at the rear of the recess. Two 5 16 inch diameter bolts exactly the same as those used for the shift lever are used to secure the emergency brake handle to the floor. All nuts are tightened and our floorboard is now ready to be positioned on our tubular steel frame. Some rubber matting used for stairways is obtained from a local home center. We cut the matting in appropriate widths so that we can apply it to all areas of the chassis that come into contact with the floor liner. This will prevent any squeaks or rattles from occurring once we've mounted our floor liner. We use 3M 1300 rubber adhesive available in a convenient tube to glue the rubber strips to the frame. While we won't be wiring the car right now, this is the ideal time for us to run the wiring harness as it is secured to the inside of the driver's side main frame rail. Following the illustrations in the instruction manual, we secure this in position with metal clamps available from the electric department of our local home center or hardware store. We permanently attach the harness with self-tapping hex head screws. The floor liner can now be placed on our frame. We simply slide the liner in from the rear, lifting it upward to clear the brake pedal. Silicone sealer or window weld is used to seal the front of the floor to the firewall. We push the floor down and into position. When necessary, we can stand on the floor using our weight to push it all the way down against the frame. We use gloves to protect our hands during this procedure.
Referring to our instruction manual, we mark all hole locations with a china marker. Our electric drill along with a quarter inch drill bit is used to drill holes through the floorboard and into the top of the frame rails on each side and the rear of the chassis. We drill six holes through the floorboard where it contacts the firewall. Six quarter inch diameter by one inch long bolts with flat washers on both sides along with lock washers and nuts are used to secure the front of the floor to the firewall. Using either a 5 16 inch hex washer head self-tapping screw approximately one inch long or a heavy pop rivet we secure the floor to the frame. This completes our floorboard installation. In order for us to properly mount and support the emergency brake cable, we fabricate two metal plates, approximately one and a quarter inch long by one and a quarter inch wide from scrap steel. We measure forward on the side of the drive shaft tunnel, approximately four inches from the rear of the floor and one inch down from the top. We mark two diagonal holes through the plates to match the ones located in the emergency brake cable brackets attached to the emergency brake cable. After marking the floorboard with a china marker, we use our electric drill with a quarter inch drill bit and drill through the fiberglass. Utilizing quarter inch diameter by one inch long bolts along with flat washers, lock washers and nuts, we secure the support plates through the fiberglass and cable brackets that have been placed against both sides of the inner drive shaft tunnel. The bolts are securely tightened. Using the Ford emergency brake yoke, we slide it over the cable and attach it to the emergency brake rod from underneath the car. We use the original nut to secure the rod to the yoke. Final adjustments can be made later. The end of the accelerator cable is pushed through the hole in the firewall from the engine compartment and the support bracket is bolted to the firewall. The accelerator pedal is positioned in place and bolted securely to the firewall with the appropriate hardware. The pedal angle and height can be adjusted for individual preference. The cable slides into the notch in the accelerator bracket and is secured with the plastic retaining clip. If the cable is a little too long, a knot can be tied in the cable to take up any slack. Since we have chosen to use the optional air conditioning, we follow the instruction manual and the instructions that come with the unit. Steel mounting brackets for the evaporator blower unit are part of the chassis. The condenser mounts in front of the radiator and the compressor to the engine. Our compact heater that we obtained from the factory bolts directly to the firewall. Following the directions in the instruction manual, as well as those that come with the unit, all hose connections are made. Our rolling chassis has been completed. The original tires have been retained and will be used for most of the assembly. When our new replicar is completed, we will mount custom wheels and new tires. We elevate the front of the chassis with our floor jack placed under the center of the front cross member. The two front jack stands are removed and the chassis is lowered slowly to the ground. The floor jack is then placed under the center of the differential at the rear. The two jack stands are removed and the car is again lowered to the ground. At this point, our new chassis is ready for the new Mercedes SSK body that we are pre-assembling. It will slip right on the chassis. A few electrical connections in the engine compartment would allow us to start the engine, but first we are going to give the entire chassis a good coat of gloss black enamel paint. 
We prefer gloss enamel to a flat paint as it is easier to keep clean and we find that in general it is more durable. We will remember to recheck everything and torque all necessary bolts to original factory specifications before running the new vehicle. Also, we will have the car thoroughly inspected, the front end aligned, and make any other necessary adjustments to meet all safety and emission requirements and standards before the car is driven. We can congratulate ourselves on a job well done.